So I want to start with kind of a big question. Like, what's the most important problem in computer science right now? You could go ask your colleagues, and you, know, you might hear answers like maybe quantum computing, or P versus NP, or maybe achieving you know, artificial general intelligence. But if you go back 50 years, the central problem in computer science was programming and programming languages. Right? There was uh, conferences. This is a picture of the famous NATO software engineering conference. Uh, not so diverse, but you see people like uh, probably Dijkstra's in there, and Naur, and uh, many others. Um, and the problem they were looking at was, you know, how do we write software at all? And there's a famous quote from, from Dijkstra's Turing Award. I won't read it, but essentially what he says is, you know, way back when computers were small and wimpy, we thought programming was hard because, well, we had to write this low-level code that was very clever because, you know, computers weren't very good. But then computers got fast, and we discovered, oh, it wasn't the speed and the, and the smallness of the, of the computers that was the problem. We just don't understand the science of programming. And this set off, I mean, really, you know, most of the work in our field, uh, developing ideas like structured programming and type systems and program logics and a whole methodology for how we can write software. And, I mean, amazing things have been achieved, right? If you think about modern software, um, of course, it's still a challenge to write good software, but uh, lots of the problems that we were struggling with 50 years ago, um, we've made great progress on. But if you step back, uh, the nature of, of big systems has changed. Um, nowadays, you know, a lot of systems are developed on the cloud, they run on phones, um, so we're no longer in the era of kind of writing a program that runs sequentially on one machine. Um, a lot of important software runs in these large, you know, planetary scale distributed systems. Um, with the end of Moore's Law, um, we're seeing the rise of accelerators, uh, things like GPUs and TPUs, and increasingly, you know, there's more computation in these specialized accelerators than there are in CPUs in, in large systems. And, you know, we, we still don't really know how to program them. And security is another just full stop. You know, you, you look in the headlines anytime you see uh, situations where large data sets of, you know, sensitive data is being, being compromised, stolen by attackers, and we, and we still don't really uh, have a good methodology for building secure systems. And so I would argue that, you know, the task that the folks at the NATO conference were concerned with, you know, how do we... Uh, raise the level of abstraction and, and build a science of programming, we still need to solve those problems uh, even, uh, even today. It's just that the underlying uh, computers have changed. And one common thing to all these modern systems is that networks really play a central role. Right? The only way that you can have a planetary scale distributed system that talks to dozens of machines or hundreds of machines in the cloud and communicates data to your phone is because there's really fast networks that connect them. Uh, the only way we can have accelerators that are coordinated with a CPU to do big computations is, again, because of some kind of uh, network locally on a system. Um, but by and large, uh, the way that we program networks, if we can program them at all, is much like uh, you know, writing machine code. Um, we don't really have high-level abstractions, uh, and we don't have uh, compilers. You know, you're sitting there kind of mucking with the bits at a very low level of abstraction. And this is more than just you know, a failure to be creative, um, for many decades, the technology that the networking industry has given us has been very closed and fixed. And I would sort of characterize this as being uh, a sort of bottom-up approach to networking. Um, and by bottom-up here, I mean the network kind of tells you what it can do, and then you have to write your program uh, given those capabilities. So what do I mean? You know, things like... Uh, you know, how you can send a packet maybe between two machines, that's not something that you can define yourself. Instead, you have to rely on what standards bodies like the IETF give you. You have to rely on distributed protocols, say BGP, which is setting up routes across the network. You have to worry about what vendors like Cisco or Juniper or these big uh, network hardware vendors tell you they can do. And so if you're a system owner and you're trying to build some big network system, you know, you may have an idea about the kind of network you'd like to support your application, but it's very hard uh, to take that idea and realize it in a practical setting. And instead, you end up mucking with all these low-level notions, IP addresses, VLANs, maybe you're tweaking link weights to get the paths you want through the network. It's very indirect, very brittle, um, and, uh, and limited. So the place we would like to go, and the place we are going, is uh, basically flipping this arrow around, right? Just as uh, when I write a program that runs on my laptop, um, I don't start by thinking about the kind of disk and the kind of memory I have and then organize my data structures uh, to, fit, to fit that. I tend to 
start with a programming language like Haskell or OCaml, and I write down the types I want, and then I compile those down onto the memory. In the same way, I'd like to be able to take uh, the network functionality I want and be able to specify it in some uh, reasonably high-level way and then compile it down to the infrastructure. And this is becoming possible. Uh, there are several key ingredients. Um, one is that the underlying hardware that we use to build network devices like routers has become more programmable. So there's the possibility to customize it to, to suit particular needs. Uh, there's the early stages, I would argue, of a family of domain-specific languages and domain-specific abstractions for describing network functionality. And then there's compilers, verification tools, and so on that take all this software and figure out how to map it down uh, to the underlying system. Um, I just want to give you a taste of some of the sort of killer applications that have been driving this so far. And I, I want to be clear that I don't think this is the limit of what we can do. It's just kind of the, the lowest hanging fruit or the, the most pressing needs uh, that have driven networking people to think about uh, generalizing networks so they can become more programmable. So the first killer app was really cloud virtualization. So the idea here is uh, if you're a big cloud company and you want to get more customers, you'd like them to be able to take, uh, you know, your customers probably have an existing deployment maybe on, on their own office or in their own, you know, their own uh, site. And you'd like them to be able to sort of take that deployment and move it to the cloud. And it's pretty easy to take you know, a Java program or a C program or a Haskell program and move it to a cloud VM. Right? It, it acts just like a server you might have locally. But there's all this other stuff uh, that's, uh, that's sort of attached to such an application, including things like specific IP addresses or specific network topologies. And so quickly, you know, these cloud companies realized if they could build a capability where you could take a network that someone had locally and emulate it in the cloud, giving the same structure, the same addresses, and everything else, then you could ease this transition path to the cloud. So there was a bunch of work, maybe about 10 years ago, uh, using programmable networks uh, to achieve this kind of network virtualization. Another killer app was uh, just traffic engineering. So this is an old problem in networking, and it's um, really the, the goal here is to pick a set of network paths that somehow serve all the traffic while minimizing cost, minimizing latency, maybe maximizing robustness. Um, and historically, this is done through distributed protocols uh, and very clever uh, ways of encoding optimization into those distributed protocols. But some of the really big cloud companies, again, started to have infrastructure that was sufficiently large that they wanted to actually use mathematical optimization to come up with you know, the perfect solution. And so having a platform where you can uh, actually, you know, take maybe a constraint solver, come up with the exact paths you want, and then push those down into the network, uh, actually save them, you know, quite a bit of money and let them run their networks much more efficiently. Another place where there's been uh, sort of a, uh, qu quite a uh, renaissance of, of work exploiting programmable networks is in monitoring. So historically, uh, if you want to understand what the network is doing, you know, think of like the analog of a debugger, um, you have very rudimentary tools. Maybe you can use command line tools like ping or traceroute, or maybe you have some boxes that can sample traffic and then give you reports of you know, what packets were going across certain links. And from that, you can try to piece together what's going on. Well, with a programmable network, you can actually build a proper debugger. You can have every packet keep track of a log of what happened to it, maybe telling you what paths it took, how much queuing it experienced, maybe causal relationships between different flows. Um, and so this can give you a very fine-grained picture of what's going on in the network, and that can inform other network operations. And then lastly, uh, there's been uh, some interest, I would say this is a little more preliminary, in what you might call in-network computing. And this is really rethinking the fundamental contract between sort of end host applications and the network. Uh, you know, in, in the internet, uh, the, the basic contract is the internet gives you best effort packet delivery and nothing else. Um, but it's possible, and in some cases it may make sense, to build richer services. So you could have the network do some caching of commonly accessed data items. You could have it implement parts of or all of consensus or coordination protocols um, that are helping multiple machines agree on the state of a system. Um, you could have the network run a failure detector. And so if you have the ability to program the network, you can do you know, some or all of these things. And there's a community that's starting to explore this. Okay, so that's just a taste of kind of where the networking field is going and 
uh, and some of, the, some of the motivating examples that are driving them to do that. I want to tell you a little bit about, uh, at the kind of system architecture level now, uh, this, this change in a little more detail. So let me define a few terms. Um, probably most of you, I hope, have taken an undergrad OS or networking class. And you might remember, uh, actually, when I interviewed for my postdoc with Jen Rexford, being a PL person, uh, my interview consisted of the question, do you know the difference between the control plane and the data plane? I said, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> and that was it. Um, so this is sort of one of the fundamental divisions of labor in a network. Yeah, Steve. OK. <laughs> I'll just keep, keep trying until, until we figure it out. So one of the main divisions of labor in a network is, uh, which goes back to sort of pretty early uh, network devices and network architectures, is the division between the control plane and the data plane. So the control plane is the part of the network that's responsible for running graph algorithms, computing paths, spanning trees, and in some cases, enforcing certain kinds of policies. And the data plane is the thing that actually forwards packets. Um, so you can think of the control plane, it's really you know, a general purpose program, and it's running probably on a CPU, whereas the data plane is uh, running on some kind of specialized hardware, and it's got uh, some kind of pipeline that can forward packets at very high data rates. So this is sort of the, the status quo that leads to bottom-up design. Uh, network equipment vendors sell you sort of both of these pieces together. Uh, the pieces implement standard protocols like IP and BGP and so on. Um, and you can put it into your network and it will work as advertised, um, but it's short of configuring it, hard to change its behavior. Okay, so once we've separated these two, um, there's no need to have a single control plane attached to every single data plane, um, we can think about uh, having one control plane that's managing many uh, data planes. Um, and this initially was called, sometimes called logical centralization. People said, oh, we can just write you know, centralized algorithms that manage a whole data center or a, a local network. Um, there's a phrase that I prefer, which is, it allows you to sort of pick the right unit of abstraction for the control plane. Historically, the control plane always had to be a fully distributed algorithm but with uh, this new kind of architecture, you can imagine having maybe a small number of control planes. Uh, you probably want several for fault tolerance or to scale, um, but you don't need to have you know, a thousand control plane instances for a thousand data planes. You could just have five. Um, we probably also want to have standard ways of communicating between the control plane and the data plane. Um, so uh, instead of having each vendor you know, implement this in some custom way that's opaque to the outside, we're just going to define some standard protocols and let anyone uh, implement the, the two sides of it. And then now the control plane doesn't need to be anything special. It can just be a server running in a rack. And then if we want to customize the control plane, maybe to implement a different kind of routing policy, we no longer have to go change BGP or go talk to standards bodies. You can just write a different program running on that server. The last piece, and the thing that's only really happened in the last, say, five or six years, is uh, the ability to also make the data plane programmable. So uh, now instead of having to implement standard protocols like IP or TCP or VLANs, you can actually define uh, custom header formats and custom processing at the data plane level as well. So this term deep programmability, it's one that we coined in a position paper last year, but the idea is that uh, instead of being this, instead of the network infrastructure being fixed and kind of telling you what it can do, uh, truly, the, the network infrastructure has become a fully programmable platform. Uh, you can program it top to bottom from the control plane to the data plane and really end to end. So you can take the, pack, the path that packets are taking and customize the processing that happens at every hop. And so now you can think of the network as being just another piece of a broader distributed system that you might be building. And you can customize the network behavior uh, to best suit that, uh, that kind of uh, distributed system. Um, so I want to shift now and talk a little bit about, uh, about how we might program this kind of system. Um, and uh, to I want to tell you a little bit more about how these data plane devices work. Um, we'll come back to this at the end of the talk. Um, but essentially, all data plane devices, whether it's a router or a switch or a gateway or a firewall, they all have a very similar structure, which is they start by taking packets coming in. Packets are just you know, bits. They parse them, and they pull out things like the headers that they might want to examine for the purposes of deciding how to forward them. And then they tend to do lookups in some kind of fast hardware tables um, that 
uh, match on certain headers, maybe look at destination addresses or other pieces of data. And then they do things like forward or drop those packets. Um, and after these decisions are made, of course, we have to uh, deparse the packets back into bits so we can send them out back on the web. So uh, they can be more complicated than this, but the key thing I want you to notice is that the sort of the, the, the action of this kind of device is in the middle, where there's this table. In general, there can be many tables, but I'm going to pretend there's just one table uh, that is really describing the behavior of the device. And uh, it can be characterized in two phases. There's uh, a match phase, where we're taking the incoming packets, all of them, and deciding how to split them up into different equivalence classes. And then there's the action phase, where we can apply uh, small uh, uh, sort of scripts or small procedures uh, to those packets. Um, I also want to tell you a little bit more about the control plane APIs. Uh, this is uh, sort of a notional uh, control plane API. Um, but essentially, um, we need messages going in both directions so we can manage the network. So we need the network to tell us about certain kinds of events like switches joining the network or ports coming up or going down. Um, we need to know about uh, statistics. And we may need to know about packets that are in the network that haven't been handled uh, by each device. And then the controller also needs a way to reconfigure the data plane. And so it has the ability to manipulate the tables. It can install, delete, and modify rules in those tables. Um, it can inject packets in the data plane. Um, for example, if it wants to discover uh, links between two devices, it might inject a special probe packet. Um, and it can also request statistics. And this is sort of the basics of how these uh, control planes work. So um, if we want to program these things, and we want to sort of apply the same ideas as were done in response to the software crisis, but in the context of networks, um, then we want to somehow raise the level of abstraction and let us think in terms of higher level things uh, than these kind of hardware notions. So the kind of built-in model that these deep programmable architectures give you is really tied to the capabilities of the underlying hardware. There are these tables, and you can describe how to populate these match action entries. Um, but it's limited to a single device, and you have to worry about very low-level questions, like how do you encode uh, the predicates that you want to match on into some linear table? Um, or how do you split up the processing uh, across an entire path into hop-by-hop -hop, uh, actions? So probably I don't have to convince you, but uh, when I first started looking at this, it, as a functional programmer and someone who sort of thinks about semantics, it was sort of immediately obvious that a much better way to think about this was to have some kind of domain-specific programming model where we can describe the behavior of the network in terms of simple composable abstractions, like maybe functions. So instead of worrying about how they're implemented, we can write these little functional programs, and these things will describe uh, you know, transformations that take in packets and spit out packets, and we can wire them together in interesting ways. So let's just explore just kind of from first principles, what such a DSL for a higher level functional abstraction for networks might look like. So I'm going to think about uh, some functions of this type. So it's going to take in packets, and it's going to give me a set of packets as outputs. Um, it'll be a set for reasons that will become clear in a moment, but just for now, you know, one of the things we might need to do is drop packets. So at a minimum, we need to be able to produce either some kind of optional value or the empty set. Um, the common case will be that packets, of course, just get forwarded. One comes in, one goes out. And I'll think of packets as just being really records. Um, in general, packets can have many different formats. But for the time being, I'm just going to pretend that packets have kind of one standard type, uh, a record with uh, maybe some headers that encode things like source and destination addresses. And I'll also throw in uh, the location of the packet, which device is it at, which port is it at on that device, as a kind of pseudo, uh, pseudo header that I can uh, work with in the same way. And if you've seen uh, talks on this work before, uh, you might remember that uh, we actually want to keep track of paths or packet histories. I'm going to elide that detail here just for the sake of simplicity. So um, the first and most fundamental thing that a network needs to do is to forward packets. And so uh, just to get going, I'm going to have a primitive that's going to let me uh, forward packets by modifying uh, this record. So I'm going to have a little uh, primitive for assignment, and I can assign the port field, which will cause the packet on a single device to get forwarded from uh, across, the, across the device from one port to the next. And even though I'm using assignment here, 
this is still describing some kind of function on packets, right? I'm, I'm modifying uh, these headers or, or pseudo headers in the packet. I'm not actually keeping state on the device. Okay, so um, now I want to take you through sort of a bunch of other constructs we could have. Um, so another uh, uh, component of this kind of language is we probably want to think not about the behavior of individual devices and then kind of stitch them together and see what happens. We actually want to program uh, whole paths or the network as a whole. And so um, we're going to allow ourselves to also sort of program the links. We're going to be able to say when should packets flow across a link from one device to another. And I'll just use this arrow notation to denote a program that uh, takes packets that are, say, at a switch A and moves them across to a switch B. Um, there's a lot of cases where uh, we need to apply different policies to different kinds of packets. Maybe packets that are for uh, web traffic go on one path, and packets that are for Zoom traffic go on another path. And so we'll want conditionals that can uh, you know, branch on different predicates that are evaluated against the packet, and then apply one program or another, uh, depending on whether the predicate is satisfied. We also, of course, want composition. So uh, we'd like to be able to take a program that describes maybe forwarding through a part of the network and another program, and we'd like to stitch those together. Uh, and there's many different kinds of composition operators we could want, but maybe the most fundamental is uh, sequential composition, you know, doing one thing and then another. And lastly, um, we also want loops. And this is a little bit counterintuitive because usually networking people don't like having loops. If you have a forwarding loop, that's a bad situation because you have packets cycling around uh, forever and ever. Um, but in many situations, it's useful to be able to describe at least iterated processing in a network. So think about uh, taking maybe one step of processing and saying, yeah, do that until packets leave the network. That's a very succinct way to describe how to achieve connectivity. OK, so putting this all together, uh, we arrive at a little DSL uh, where we have uh, a set of predicates. This is just simple Boolean predicates evaluated over the fields in this record that encodes packets. And then we have a little uh, programming language uh, where the programs include an identity program that does nothing, a drop program that produces no packets as output, uh, assignment, sequential composition, conditionals, loops, and this link construct that forwards from one device to another. And uh, this is, I think, quite natural. Um, and some of the early work that we did on SDN languages look like this. Um, there's a little fly in the ointment, which is uh, it's actually impossible with the syntax I've shown you here to write a program that produces multiple packets. Right? Every packet produces either zero, sorry, every program produces either zero or one packets. And so there's never the possibility of doing anything like broadcast or multicast. So you could imagine adding a special primitive to do this. And in fact, some of the early languages that I worked on had such a primitive. Maybe there's a primitive flood, and the semantics of flood is. If a packet comes in, flood will copy that packet n times, where n is the number of other ports on the device, and then it will forward uh, one copy of the packet out each of those ports. And this is maybe a sensible thing to do, um, but there's a little puzzle. Sorry, my fonts seem to have gotten uh, corrupted when going to the presentation laptop. But the little puzzle is, you know, what happens when you compose flood with itself? So does that somehow produce n squared packets? Do we somehow deduplicate things? Um, and I don't think these problems are insurmountable, but it sort of suggests that maybe you know, there's something a little odd going on here. And so uh, there's a, a sort of second take on this kind of DSL, and this is uh, one that, that we've sort of ended up with as being uh, a little bit more natural. And essentially the idea is instead of throwing in big operations like flood that are um, sensible from an operational perspective but a little bit clunky semantically, we're going to try and distill these operations down to uh, simpler, more orthogonal primitives. In particular, we're going to add a union operator, which I'll write with a plus, which duplicates packets and then applies uh, one of two programs uh, to each copy. And using this union operator, we can encode flood fairly easily uh, if we know the number of ports on a device. And we can apply similar streamlining uh, to other uh, operators. So instead of loops, we can have iteration. Um, instead of conditionals, we can encode that with union. Um, and we can actually smash together a bunch of the other operations, including the logical predicates and an or. We can conflate those with, uh, with sequential composition and union. Um, we can derive the, the trivial programs for identity and drop as just 
uh, trivial filters, true and false. And so we end up with this very minimalistic kind of core calculus uh, that encodes everything we've seen, uh, but in a simpler and more orthogonal way. And if you haven't seen this before, the other neat thing about this is uh, we can align this DSL with a system called CAT uh, that Dexter Cozen invented about 20 years ago. Um, what CAT is, is the combination of uh, a language of Boolean predicates and a language of regular expressions. Um, Dexter was interested in this because he was interested in having nice algebraic models of imperative programming. And uh, we take the same foundation and add this interpretation in terms of packet processing functions and some additional primitives like uh, forwarding on a link or modifying fields in a header, um, and we, achieve, we get a system called Netcat. So the thing I want you to take away from this, if you didn't follow the details, is um, first, you, know, you can sort of apply the, the toolkit of the ICFP community, right? going in with a sort of semantic mindset and designing DSLs where you're guided in the design of the DSLs both by the operational considerations in the domain, but also by trying to do things in a clean semantic way. Um, and even better, if you can align with an existing mathematical framework, um, that framework can give you some guidance. It can tell you, you know, what kind of primitives to have or uh, how to interpret certain operations. Um, in the case of NetCat, uh, this actually, the CAT uh, framework gave us um, both guidance in deciding how to resolve tricky issues like this question of how to do flood, as well as a ready-made verification toolkit. So uh, this NetCat language, I'm not gonna show you all the details, but um, we've studied the semantics uh, in actually all different ways. Um, so we have a denotational semantics that looks much like the functional uh, interpretation I was showing you in pictures. We also have an axiomatic semantics that's uh, essentially uh, you know, inherited from, from CAT itself. And then over the last few years, we've also developed an operational semantics where we interpret these CAT programs as being a kind of automata. And that's very useful in building implementations. And these three things, uh, these three semantics, all fit together uh, with nice theorems uh, telling you that they agree and capture the same thing. I wanna show you just kind of an application of, uh, of this language and how some of the pieces in the semantics can be put to work to, to solve real problems. And this goes back to that first uh, killer app I showed you for deep programmability, which was virtualization. So I want you to imagine that the physical network is the thing shown in gray here. It's kind of a straightforward tree topology with switches numbered one through seven. Um, the ports are shown in small numbers. Uh, you don't have to follow the details, but if you're curious, those are the, the ports that connect up adjacent switches. And imagine that I wanna take a virtual network. So I wanna pretend that this network just has a single device. And the device has outgoing ports that correspond to the low ends of the tree. So you can imagine that a customer, say in a cloud network, would have you know, one switch that they had in their office. They wanna move this thing to the cloud, but the cloud provider is gonna run their network uh, in this tree topology. And so the task we'd like to solve is, we'd like to take maybe programs written against the virtual network. Here's a program in yellow that just implements forwarding between the four ports and the virtual switch um, as, as followed by, by destination addresses. And we like to somehow realize that in the physical network. And so using our implementation of this DSL, um, we can actually do this. Um, so here's a little demo of our compiler running on that exact program that I just showed you on the last slide. And what it spits out is a set of forwarding tables, so the low-level programs um, for the physical network that implement the semantics of the virtual program um, when, when laid over the physical network. So I'm just showing you here a couple of the rules from uh, switch one, the switch at the very root of this tree, and the rules highlighted in orange, the first two, say if we receive packets coming in on port two and they're going over to host six, then we should send those out port five, which is the next top down toward six, and if you look at the other switches, they would, they would implement the rest of the path. So again, the thing to notice is that you know, we're getting a very succinct abstraction of, uh, of this behavior of just connectivity between these four hosts, and the compiler is filling in all the details for mapping this to the physical topology and also mapping it down to the underlying tables. How does it do this? Um, well, you can read our ICFP 15 paper for that, but essentially it's exploiting some of the semantics that CAT and NetCAT give us, in particular, the, this representation of programs as a kind of automata, 
and it uses that to systematically figure out um, how to simulate the behaviors in the virtual network down at the physical layer, and also how to implement um, uh, non-local uh, transits of data through the physical network. Um, so this is a, just a, a quick diagram of the automaton for that virtual program laid over the physical network, and the compiler then takes all this, kind of crunches it together, and then spits out the tables. Okay, so um, I'm a little bit short on time because of uh, technical glitches, but I wanna turn now and show you one other example where uh, functional ideas can be used to solve a kind of thorny problem in these uh, deeply programmable networks. And you might have noticed, you know, I've kind of completely ignored the control plane so far. So I've given you a little model for how you can program the data plane. Um, but of course, uh, there's lots of cases where the control plane is important. It has to monitor network events like switches joining and leaving or ports going up and down or shifts in traffic demand. So it's taking all this information and it's computing a set of forwarding behaviors for the network. Um, and, and that's important. And so far, the little functional language I showed you based on Netcat, it can't do those things, right? It, it just implements a pure function um, that forwards packets, but it doesn't respond to, to events. And so I wanna show you a little example uh, to motivate why implementing these kinds of dynamic changes might be hard. Um, and I'm gonna use this uh, kind of simplistic topology here where I want you to imagine that there's on the left sort of two classes of traffic, uh, maybe public traffic that's coming in off the internet and also uh, traffic coming in over a VPN that is more trusted. And then we have a few network devices, some routers, some firewalls, and those are sitting in front of uh, two sets of servers, some internal servers and some external servers. And what we wanna achieve is that the public traffic should not be able to reach the internal servers, right? Only VPN traffic can get to the internal servers. And there's various ways we could do this. Um, essentially, we have to configure the routers and the firewalls uh, to correctly identify the two different kinds of incoming traffic and then uh, filter and forward uh, correspondingly. So one way you could do this is you could use the routers to classify the VPN traffic and the public traffic. And then you could configure the firewalls so that uh, for the public traffic, uh, we prevent them from going to the internal servers. Um, but for the VPN traffic, we allow them to go anywhere. And just for simplicity, I'm gonna assume that sort of each firewall um, is sort of either doing this filtering or it's kind of open and allows anything to pass through. So a first configuration that implements our policy is the VPN traffic is routed via firewall one. Firewall one is open, so it lets you talk to any server. And the public traffic goes via firewalls two and three. Um, so they're actually doing some work. Now you can imagine that you wanna shift over to a different configuration, maybe where the VPN traffic goes via these two firewalls, one and two, and the public traffic is being uh, shunted over just to three. And the problem is, you know, how do you actually implement this update? So we have a control plane, it's decided, okay, you know, maybe the traffic loads have gotten too high and I want to reallocate my uh, routers and resources in this way, but how do I actually implement this shift from the first configuration to the second? And the problem is if we're not careful, if we just do this naively, um, we can end up uh, violating our overall policy, which is that public traffic shouldn't reach the internal servers, even though these two configurations both satisfy you. In particular, you know, if, if some attacker uh, sends public traffic and it gets to the first router, and then we go update the firewalls, it might be that the first router still sends the public traffic to firewall number two, but now firewall two is open. And so the attacker can get to the internal servers, which is a violation of our policy. And you know, these kinds of problems in network updates uh, are, are not just a kind of academic notion, they, they happen a lot in practice. Um, there are situations where connections are broken, access control is violated, uh, sometimes uh, links get overwhelmed because too much traffic is going on a certain link during an upgrade, uh, you get transient forwarding loops, and network operators have sort of common heuristics they use to avoid these situations. Uh, they use things like make before break, the idea being that you kind of set up the new configuration before you tear down the old. Um, but these don't handle all of the tricky situations that arise in practice. And you can go read postmortems from uh, large sophisticated companies and find that uh, sometimes uh, the outages they have are actually caused by these kinds of updates. So if you step back and you sort of don't worry about the 
kind of low-level details, but just kind of think what's really gone on here. The problem with these kind of naive or undisciplined network updates is that packets, which were carefully programmed maybe with a nice functional model uh, to satisfy certain properties, are now being executed with multiple programs, right? The old program and the new program. And so if I have some property like my security policy that I had for that uh, example, that may not be preserved by an update, right? If I have a packet that maybe takes some number of steps through the network with the old policy, and then I finish with a suffix which is from the new policy, who knows if, if that will satisfy the property, right? The property may not be robust to that kind of stitching together of paths. So uh, if we want to avoid these situations, um, we can define a, some kind of criterion, I'm going to call it a consistency guarantee, um, to basically rule out these situations. Um, and one possible candidate for such a guarantee is that when we're updating from a configuration A to a configuration B, we want it to be the case that at least every packet that's going through the network sees a consistent version. So it sort of is processed with the A function or the B function, but not some weird mixture of the two. And it's really easy to show. It's almost silly to call this a theorem, but you can show that if you have any per packet consistent update, so anything that satisfies this guarantee, then it's going to preserve every safety property that's satisfied by both A and B. In particular, the, the bad situation I showed you with that um, simple network and, and firewalls, um, we wouldn't have that behavior because uh, the, the attacker's packet would either uh, go through the, the green or the blue. And again, the key insight here is, you know, instead of uh, staying down at the level of routing tables or individual nodes, think about uh, kind of the network as a whole implementing some kind of function and think about what properties of that function you'd like uh, as applied to each packet. Now, you might wonder, how can I actually implement uh, these kinds of uh, consistent updates? And there's actually been a little cottage industry in, uh, in coming up with efficient ways of doing this. But I just want to show you sort of one general algorithm uh, that we came up with in our first paper on this called two-phase updates. Um, and the idea is basically to use uh, versions and a clever two-round protocol uh, to do these updates. Um, so first, we're going to have every packet carry a, some kind of tag or version that tells us uh, which function it is being processed with. And that tag will be attached when the packet enters the network, and it will then be used to ensure that we only uh, use that same function all the way through. So when we want to do an update. What we do is we take all of the forwarding rules for all the devices, and before we install them, we kind of post-process them, and we add a check for the version corresponding to the new configuration. We then go install all those rules everywhere in the network, and notice these rules are unreachable. They're, they're dead code, because all the rules check for the new version, but so far, no packets are carrying that version. Then, once we know the new version's there, we go around the perimeter of the network, and we update the rules that allow packets to come into the network so that they get, so that, you know, one by one, they get the new version. So now, for some period, we have some packets still entering with perimeter nodes that have not been updated, and they get the old version but some packets enter with the new version and they get that behavior. Once we know that all in-flight packets with the old version will have left the network, um, we can do that by uh, looking at uh, you know, how, um, the diameter of the network and how long packets can be queued, we can then go garbage collect all the old rules. So this is a very simple protocol. Uh, it works with any topology and any, any configuration. Um, it can be done in parallel. Uh, most of the operations can be parallelized, so it's very fast. Um, the main downsides are, of course, it requires extra memory because you have both versions of the function installed in the network, and you need to add this tag to a packet. Nevertheless, this has been uh, you know, quite an influential way of thinking, and it's deployed, for example, at, at Google Cloud in, in their uh, network update system. Okay, so I'm just about out of time. I want to kind of pull things together and talk a little bit about future-looking work. Um, so um, I've talked a lot about sort of these two pieces, how we can apply functional thinking to programming data planes and also, to a certain extent, to programming control planes. Um, what I've been working on for the last five years is kind of going one level deeper and looking at uh, lower level and more flexible abstractions for the data plane itself. And there's a language called P4 that was proposed in 2014. Uh, Dave Walker and Cole Schlesinger, who are two ICF peers, were involved in the initial design um, and then there's been a, a, a large open source community working on it. And what P4 is trying to do is to um, go beyond 
uh, a data plane where you kind of have some standard set of uh, match action tables that you can configure, but actually make it truly programmable. So you can define the formats of the packets that are coming into each router. You can define state variables that are used by packets as they go across those routers. Um, and you can customize the pipeline to suit uh, particular protocols. And in particular, uh, P4, like many industrial languages, uh, it's designed by a committee. Uh, it's got, uh, it, it does not have a formal spec. Uh, it, it has a kind of uh, English document that defines its semantics. It has a large C++ uh, reference compiler. Um, so what we've been doing is uh, trying to bring uh, sort of foundations to, the, to this language um, by uh, following the footsteps of many people here and you know, defining uh, the language syntax and semantics completely formally, in fact, in Coq, and then starting to build uh, verified implementations uh, that can compile those P4 programs to uh, either software implementations, and eventually we'd like to do hardware implementations as well, where we can prove an end-to-end -end theorem showing that the P4 program has been correctly implemented by the target. Um, stepping back a little bit, um, this idea of deeply programmable networks has uh, many, many places where PL people can be involved. And although it's been going on for you know, more than a decade, um, there's still, uh, I think, a lot of work to be done. Um, the low-level languages are still being debated and, and ironed out, and there's higher-level abstractions that also, you know, there's some initial proposals, things like Netcat or so-called intent frameworks, which is the industry term for, for similar languages. Um, but there's no standards here, and um, uh, I think there's, uh, you know, the possibility of, of lots more good ideas. And one thing I love working about, in, that I love about working in this space is, um, it's, uh, it's not a place where you have to kind of ask for guidance uh, about you know, what's, what's a good solution, what's a bad solution, because there's literally decades of operational uh, networking work that can help you understand you know, what, what problems are and, and, and what a solution might look like. Um, now, of course, sometimes all that operational experience might torque your thinking, but at least there's a ready set of applications and users um, that, can, uh, that can, can give you some guardrails. Um, there's also the possibility of transitioning some of these ideas uh, into, into real products, either an open source or an industry. Um, so I've highlighted a few of the ways that some of our work and work by others um, has, has had successful transitions. Um, so I'll just mention that um, uh, Netcat itself is not directly used in any industry products as well I'm aware of, but there's a whole bunch of what are called intent frameworks that have very high level and I would say functional descriptions of what kind of connectivity you want. And pretty much all of the major uh, SDN control frameworks have these. Uh, network virtualization, which I showed you, um, is the main technology behind VMware's NSX product. That's their main networking control product. Uh, consistent updates are used in Google Cloud. Um, similar techniques are actually used internally in a lot of uh, routers, in the drivers that implement updates to those routers. Uh, there's been a big push for network verification, which I haven't really talked about today, but there's both teams at big companies as well as startups um, that are taking uh, precise models of network behavior and starting to do reasoning about them. Um, in particular, Gawa, who's of course here at ICFP, has been starting to develop a cellular verification framework based on Netcat. Um, and there's a growing community of academic users of frameworks like P4 and Petra. I'm going to just close with a couple of open problems. Um, I think there's, again, lots of work to do, and I would encourage anyone who wants to work on applied problems and think about kind of programming in this richer space um, to, to get involved. Um, I've just kind of categorized them in a, a few kind of broad bullets. So um, one, as I say, I think language design is still pretty wide open. Um, there's been some initial work on very low-level, hardware-entered languages, um, but there's still lots of other languages that we need. Um, and I think PL people uh, with our sort of tools and taste uh, can come have a lot of impact here. Um, one area I'm particularly interested in is how we can uh, think about bringing uh, language-based security to networks. So right now, if you think about uh, interacting with uh, a network through you know, the sockets abstraction that an OS gives you, you're basically thinking in terms of IP addresses. Um, but in many situations, you can imagine wanting to understand how much you should trust a certain endpoint or the path to that endpoint, or middle boxes on the way to that endpoint. And so I think there's space for sort of a, um, what I'm calling chain of trust networks that would let us um, have abstractions that tell us not just about who we're talking to, but how we're talking to them. Um, there are many problems in compilers. Um, of course, network data planes have to be fast, and there's uh, work both in routers as well as at the edge 
uh, things like Nix and accelerators, um, where uh, you know good ideas and compilers for how you map C programs or P4 programs down onto those accelerators well. Um, you can have an immense amount of impact. Um, there's actually a growing community using WebAssembly to do packet processing. Um, so if you're interested in WebAssembly, uh, you could do some work there. Lots of work in verification. Um, a lot of it has focused so far on thinking about kind of reachability properties. You know, does my network connect or isolate certain kinds of traffic from each other? But again, I think there's a whole uh, spectrum of uh, richer verification projects we could do, including connecting to hardware, thinking about things like timing channels, um, and of course, developing program logics to make these, all this verification more accessible. Um, in industry, there's a lot of focus right now at the edge. Um, so part of this is just driven by maybe financial interests. There's sort of this emerging um, platform with lots of computers, maybe close to cell towers or in uh, uh, you know, offices close, close to self-driving cars or factories or farms. And so there's a sort of a big tussle right now trying to figure out you know, what are the abstractions for edge computing and edge networking look like. Um, and again, I think there's a chance to have some uh, impact from PL folks there. And then there's kind of, if you're not interested so much in these different verticals, but want to think about sort of cross-cutting issues, um, there's uh, state, there's dealing with failures, there's incorporating performance and quantitative reasoning, and of course, machine learning is coming for networks too. So lots to do, and if you're the kind of person who likes doing low-level PL work, I think you'd have a lot of fun. So let me stop there. I want to thank um, my collaborators on this work, uh, a bunch of, uh, I won't name them all, but a bunch of students, uh, mentors uh, and colleagues, um, and if you want to find more uh, papers and, and slides are on my website. Thanks.